A quick PSA before we get started. We came back from hiatus just in time for me to get COVID. And one of my very fun COVID symptoms has been an excruciating headache whenever I look at a computer, for example, for a long time. So we have a backslog of episodes to edit, and spooky season might very well be going into November at this point. I am trying my absolute best to get rid of this backlog, but it has been very difficult. At this point, I'm just uploading these on the day that I am able to get them finished because I'm not able to edit as quickly as I was able to before. So please enable notifications on whatever platform of your choice. Keep with us on social media. All the links are in our link tree. And without further ado, here is the next installment of our Pride series. We're in the place where mysteries and the missing meet. Where conspiracies lurk around every corner. Welcome to the Deep Dark Truth. This episode contains graphic or explicit content that may be disturbing, violent, or sexual in nature. Listener discretion is advised. Welcome back to the Deep Dark Truth. I'm Mo. I'm Chip. And I'm Mikey. And today we are going to be discussing missing person Sequoia Cooper as part of our Pride series and also having a larger conversation about how inaccessible information can be when it comes to crime cases in the trans community, but most especially trans women of color such as Sequoia. We've attempted in the past to cover other murdered and missing trans people of color and found it to be extremely difficult, which is still the case. But today we're going to be trying our best to give you all of the information we've been able to gather on Sequoia and also have a conversation about other missing and murdered trans women, especially those that have happened thus far in 2022. With that said, Chip, how about you get us started? So Sequoia Cooper is a 33-year-old woman born August 9th, 1988. She was last seen on August 31st, 2021 in Columbus, Ohio, when she left to go to the store to get water around 1130 at night. Her partner, who we'll talk more about in a moment, said that she had received a text shortly before she left, but we don't know the contents of that text, whether the police do or not. They're at least not available to the public. She's about 5'5", 145 pounds, brown eyes, dark brown hair, in lemonade braids, so up to the side. She was last seen wearing a black and white summer dress and black and white baby fat sandals. She's got two tattoos, one on each thigh. One says, go get that money, money being dollar sign, and the other says Sequoia. She was last seen at either the area around Howie Road and Weldon Avenue in North Columbus, or possibly East Weber Road and Cleveland Avenue in her black 2009 Ford Fusion. We'll get to that in a second. We think that the East Weber Cleveland Avenue was based on a tip and she was actually last seen in the North Columbus area. She was seen in her Ford Fusion, which was recovered later in October with stolen license plate. Or her original license plate is still out there, so in case this is information that is helpful for someone, if anyone should find such a license plate or something, her original plate is an Ohio plate Golf Juliet. Papa, 9303. And of course, that license plate would now be considered evidence and could possibly lead to the person that was last seen in her car. Her partner, Richard Harris, said late last year that Cooper failed to return to her home near Crimeans Park after she left to buy bottled water at a nearby store. Though he called her cell phone repeatedly, he said it appeared to be turned off and that it was extremely out of character for her. Her adopted mother, Luann Cooper, also contributed to how out of character it was and spoke about how Sequoia would call her every day before going to work, but she has not heard from her since her disappearance. He also received tips of sightings at a nearby gas station, but those tips didn't pan out, and that is the tip that we believe led to the East Weber and Cleveland Avenue area tip. At some point that is unclear, he started receiving text messages with requests for ransom, $7,000 to get her back or $500 just to speak to her, which he said he turned over to the Columbus missing persons detectives. Here's a quote from an article by the Columbus Dispatch. Police brushed them off like it was a prank, unquote. He also acknowledged that, quote, there is some sick people in the world, unquote. Another quote from rblackgirls.com, 
which honestly, ourblackgirls.com had the most information that mm-hmm. we were able to find in yep. one continuous place about Sequoia's disappearance. Like by far, like not comparable. Yeah. They're They're doing a lot of work. It's clear. Quote, I mean, you see this every day on the TV and on the milk cartons, but you never really realize the depths of this because there ain't never no closure until you find something. This is some of the worst shit that you could possibly go through. Sergeant Scott Leroy of the Missing Persons Unit said, quote, We believe that this missing person may be the victim of foul play, and we believe that there is a possibility that, that someone out there needs that little bit of oomph when you see this family that's suffering to come forward and give us the information that we need, unquote. Sequoia's biological brother, James Carswell, who re- resides in Georgia but was in Columbus to help the search effort, created a GoFundMe, which Mikey is going to tell you about. So the GoFundMe mentions that outside help is appreciated, whether that be contributions, volunteering, or information. Her family believes that this is not a runaway situation in addition to the police suspecting foul play. Her brother in this GoFundMe post details her dedication to her job as a GM at Popeye's in North Columbus, as well as her two dogs. The GoFundMe also set to assist with taking care of her animals and the search. This post also mentions, Unfortunately, our family has to prepare for the worst now that her car was located last October. Forensic evidence is starting to show she was a victim of foul play. This is the first mention of the forensic evidence that we saw in our research, aside from the circumstantial conclusions you can draw from her car being found with a stolen plate. So compared to episodes like our Lauren Spear episode, for example, Mm -hmm. or our Gabby Petito episodes, this is pretty much the end of the amount of information that we have. And we've been recording for less than 10 minutes. Yeah. And the thing is, this is so much more information than we could find on any other uh, missing or murdered trans woman of color. This is like blowing them out of the water. Yeah. Which is the most depressing. (laughs) Because we've tried to make this this episode many times. But before we kind of move on to that discussion portion and talk a little bit more about not only this case, but other cases we've tried to cover, other missing and murdered trans women of color. We do want to say that the Columbus Division of Police can be reached at 614-645-4545. The Columbus Missing Persons Unit can be reached at 614-645-2358. And the agency case number is 210-659-143. So what I found really weird about this case is that she was so known and so interactive. She was well known and had family and had friends and had co-workers and nobody knows or saw anything. Yeah, actually, the reason that I found out about this to begin with, I think it was Columbus Pride had posted basically that she hadn't been found yet, Mm -hmm. trying to raise awareness and I was like, okay, I, I haven't heard of her. Let's just try again. Let's just right. try. There's, we have so many docs that exist just for if we find new information or new information comes out on a case. Mm. Episodes that can't be episodes yet because not only a lot of times is there not enough information, but I don't want to personally contribute. I know neither of you do either to misinformation. So Mm -hmm. sometimes all there is is rumors and nothing's been substantiated. And I don't feel comfortable if there's not at least two sources saying relatively the same thing. I don't feel comfortable putting any of that out into the world because what happens is that when people do hopefully take an interest in the case and start asking questions and start raising awareness, they're raising awareness and looking in the wrong places and they're directing other people to look in the wrong places. And it just ends up not being helpful at all. I also think it's interesting to mention that Sequoia went missing about a week ish before Gabby Petito went missing. It might have been two weeks, but it was relatively in the same yeah, time period. It was like two weeks, I think. Which obviously we're we're glad that Gabby's body was able to be recovered and that her family was able to find out what happened to her. This isn't to say that that we don't want all 
yeah. missing or murdered people to be able to be brought to justice. In a weird way, van life itself has become such a big thing in the last five years. Also, the domestic violence where there was an actual person that people could look at and say, we think that they did it. That gets people more in an uproar. And those two things together, I think, helped push Gabby's case to the forefront because it's like here are these here's this niche thing that is like instagram worthy and even a lot of the articles they would say like rising instagram star i mean they had a decent amount of followers but not really that many before all knew she was missing and people started following to look at every detail of their instagram look at every single account that they had across different social media like like dirt and other things yeah it's sad that like you have to have a hook to get your case out there supporting and protecting trans and people of color is is niche and is cool it is instagram worthy and that's the thing but there's no equality done behind the scenes. There's no in type of investigation and time spent and leads followed up and phone calls made. And uh, It's also interesting in that this case with Sequoia, it looks like it's probably not trans uh, motivated. It's probably, it doesn't seem like it's like right. that sort of, it's not a hate crime. It's, just a regular murder or regular yeah. kidnapping, it, right. which is also speaks to the fact that we have more information than we normally do. It wasn't just yeah. a, an attack well, on someone we do outside know, a pride. We do know it was a theft. Well, yeah, we know the car least. was taken and found. So, yeah. And so that obviously we can't know exactly their motivations, but right. thus far with the information that we know, it feels like the motivation was theft or or carjacking or robbery right. or wrong place, wrong time yeah. type of situation. As opposed to I just walked can't. out of a queer bar. Or and... all of the above right. and rape and murder, too. Oh, yeah. I mean, it could be. Yeah. yeah. And Not that's why it's sad that we don't know more. So in regards to news coverage and coverage that we've tried to find, I do want to talk a little bit about an article The Advocate released and that this article is actually, I think, a month and a half old-ish by mm -hmm. Trudy King. And literally the title of the article was just, Here are the Trans Americans Killed in 2022 so far. So it it mentions that at least 57 trans people died last year as the result of violence some of them were domestic violence situations but also that is a sort of uh the black what do they call it the black void of uh crime statistics is it probably is a lot more than that but those are the only ones that got reported to, to the police yeah. in the way that they got categorized yeah right. so at least 57 trans people died last year as a victim as a victim in some type of violent crime. And of course, there's many other missing trans people right. that many more. we don't know their status of. And also, these are the ones that died as a result of this specific type of violence. Some people might not be out. There's all types of things that can skew right. statistics. Mm -hmm. But I just want to talk about some examples. Amari Lee is 21 died in Pittsburgh on January 1st, kicked off the year. She was shot. She was one of a half dozen trans people of color that died in that very specific area in the last year. And that's that's almost word for word, a direct quote from the advocate. <sighs> Ball Princess, she was found shot in Florida. Matthew Spampanato, a 21-year-old tr trans man, was hit and killed in a hit and run car crash. Naomi Skinner was fatally shot in Highland Park, Michigan. Her boyfriend was charged with second degree murder. There are some that are immediately there is a suspect. They are domestic and therefore they move relatively quickly. But that is not the typical case. But in some cases, that's why you don't hear about them. Cypress Ramos, 21, was found dead in Lubbock, Texas, in a storage unit. Paloma Vasquez was found shot to death in Houston. 
Tatiana LaBelle was found dead March 18th. She was put into a trash can after being beaten to death in Chicago. Catherine Newhouse was fatally shot by her own father in Georgia. Keisha Webster was found dead in Jackson, Mississippi. Mia Love Parker was found shot in Chester, Pennsylvania. Fern Feather was found stabbed to death in Morristown, Vermont. Ariana Mitchell was found shot to death at a party in Hampton, Virginia. Ray Muscat was found shot to death in Oakland County, Michigan. Nidra Sequence Morris was found dead in Opelika, Florida. Shanalika Yella Dior Hemingway was murdered in Albany, and the police have not disclosed the manner of death. Those are just one-liners about trans people that have been murdered this year. And in most of the cases, there is one or two lines about who they were as a person. And the only reason that we're not including them is because just quoting two sentences for for each of them would just be us reading you this article which we of course have linked in our sources so in that case we have even a trusted news source such as the advocate which is the biggest news source concerning lgbtqia plus people and even they don't have enough information to do more than a paragraph Mm -hmm. in a lot of these cases. Yep. Sad. With their press badges, their resources, their sources, their staffing, Mm -hmm. even spaces that are supposed to be quote unquote gay friendly or quote unquote lesbian friendly. That does not mean that they're trans friendly. Oop. Yeah. Yep. Even within our own communities, our own spaces, it is the job of everyone in that community, no matter what their descriptor or orientation or gender is, to be advocating not only for inclusion, Mm -hmm. but but also the fact that there isn't the amount of inclusion that there should be is part of the reason we're not hearing these stories. You would think that other queer people would want to read and raise awareness and rise up in the face of people being murdered and going missing that are within that community. But there is such a disconnect for a lot of reasons. But one of the reasons, in my opinion, is that... Once gay marriage was legalized, some people just felt like, I don't want to fight anymore. I don't want to be fighting for anything anymore. I want to be done. I fought for this thing for decades of my life. Before that, I was fighting awareness for AIDS because people were dying. Before that, I was just fighting to live. And so... It's like, I want to be done now. I don't want to. And that's just really, it's not an excuse. Because trans women of color were at the forefront. Yeah. It's, it's, completely, it's completely backwards in that the T made it, made it a safe country for the L and the G. And it really the is. the L and the G have no interest now when it's, the most needed for the T to be safe and even the B that they completely don't treat equally and that that they disinclude when they're preaching inclusion. It's so backwards. I don't understand it. The inclusion aspect, uh, it feels, uh, this is just my perspective and Chip can talk about his perspective. It's clicky as fuck. (laughs) And that's really the only way to describe it. It's almost like creating its own hierarchy. The sense of pride makes you feel loved and included and whatever. We're all one. We're all the same. And people argue, well, orientation is different than gender. And it's like, yeah, you can say that now, but with our our modern descriptors and how we label things and how far psychology has come and what we understand about trans people and intersex people and blah 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 but nobody cared during the stonewall riot right. if the people that were fighting were trans like you can't say that 
people that were pillars of a community and our entire community is owed to them the backbreaking work done by the trans woman of color in the beginning and now yeah should be discluded because your thing isn't exactly like my thing Mm -hmm. they're they're not quite the same enough Mm -hmm. like no bullshit and there's a sort of like divide in the queer community where you've got there's a lot of assimilationist idea like the, your mm-hmm. classical as it were white cis gay man white yeah. cis uh, lesbian are looking i'm just like one of you straight people just let me be a straight person but don't stop being mean whereas you've got the rest of the community where it's like no um we're not just like that let's uh, let's be radical and accept who we actually are and not just play by their rules I think that that's like an old school form of activism. That's what it was. It was like, wait, we're just like you because we want to get married because we want to adopt children. But the community in and of itself, just by being part of it, it makes you different. You are different. The inclusionary way that they wanted to look at it, it was trying to be like, we're not that different. Mm-hmm. Versus accepting the things that are. When in reality, the LGBT community is overwhelmingly not that. Are not families that have children. They're polyamorous. They're monogamous. They're open. They're The overwhelming majority are not that nuclear family. Yeah. Yeah, the asexuals and the so, aromantics who are also getting thrown as- under the, the as- bus. The assimilation never made sense. The thing you have to remember, though, too, is that the largest percentage of the community are by women. And that is where the statistics kind of get skewed, but you don't think of by women when you think of the community because it's not the face of the community. It's not the representation Correct. of the community. It's not it who has a voice it in the community. It immediately goes to gay guy. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And they're the, they're one of the minority completely gay men look that stonewall movie where they like invented a gay man <laughs> yeah you know why yeah. they did that <laughs> yeah no absolutely 100 yeah, percent. so weird yeah it is weird in yeah. the gallup news consensus or whatever this year 7.1 percent of america identifies as lgbt so forbes says that in 2021 375 transgender people were killed it does not specify all of the different ways but one in four of those murdered were killed in their own home so by someone they know or by someone that specifically targeted them knowing where they lived nine tenths of those 96 percent were trans women specifically half of those a little over half of those were murdered sex workers yeah, there's another community that gets thrown under the bus. Oh, my God. And most of them, but it does not cite the statistic, were black or migrant trans women of color. So horrifying statistics. That isn't – and there's conversations happening, but those conversations are a lot like this conversation we're having now. It's an overarching, this is what's happening in this community. Wow, this is awful. Instead of – these are the very specific places where there's not a much groundwork laid in these cases where police departments aren't doing enough or people are specifically being targeted for hate crimes in these general areas. And these conversations are happening, you know, exactly like this in this tiny little queer community, the three of us talking on our podcast, not on any sort of national level or state level or anything. You know, if Gabby Petito hadn't happened at the same time as Sequoia Cooper, Sequoia Cooper's story still not would have picked up any real hype. You know, maybe it could have. I would like it if it had. That's a loser. But realistically, (laughs) statistically, (laughs) and again, I just have to call back to what Chip said. It's very interesting that she wasn't abducted or taken or killed or anything at, at a place that was especially queer or especially yeah. making her a target. It's not overtly a hate crime. Do you think that would have affected the um, 
any more information coming forward, though? I think it would have, but it would have been from queer people that were outside that bar smoking or queer people that were going to or from the bar. It would have been tips from within the community. I don't think it would have been tips from neighbors. I think it could have affected because more people would have been around in a congested space to potentially see someone. But even then, how many were murdered in their homes? This conversation has definitely devolved, but the problem is that there's so much nuance because there's people outside of the community, how publicity gets cases more attention versus what's happening inside the community and why cases aren't getting that much attention, even though they should be getting the attention. Everything would make you think hear all these people talk about the homosexual agenda you would think that we're a borg hive mind that we all have singular purposes that we're all have the same goals but that's just not how it is we can't even all get behind to share a advocate post about a missing trans woman why is that i don't want to be scared of going back down the ladder of society and therefore I'm choosing not to involve myself actively. Mm -hmm. And in the case of some allies, I think it's just willful ignorance. Period. You have to imagine, you know, me on Facebook and being really connected in the queer community here and then getting posts in the advocate and speaking out the way that I did in multiple posts. Do you know how many friends I've lost <laughs> from that? Not friends. Not <laughs> yeah. friends. Um, Zero. Not friends, first and foremost. But that's but that's it. It's some some of that is that fear. And that's coming of, from inside yeah. our own community. Like, how yeah. dare you speak up against a gay camp not allowing trans people mm-hmm. in their camp? Like, Why how are dare you, you do that? Gay men? We could be here another three hours. We're not going to be here another three hours, but we did want to put together something. We felt really responsible in highlighting some of these cases and and kind of explaining why we're not covering them. Until next time, this has been The Deep Dark Truth.